salvation. So in the book of Revelation 7, chapter 1, after this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel, this is John speaking, coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of these who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 from the following tribes, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and from the tribe of Benjamin. After, the, uh, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, were holding palm branches in their hands. They cried, cried aloud in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let me give you a summary of what's happened now in the book of Revelation. If you want to know what's happened before this, go and listen to the other sermons. But what's happened over here in this moment is there's a group of people that have been identified, that have been sealed by God to achieve something very specific on earth. It's the Hebrew people. It mentions these 144,000, it's 12,000 of each of the tribes here. For those of you who know your Bible, you'll notice the tribe of Dan isn't represented there. There's a lot of speculation as to why Dan isn't mentioned. Uh, possibly because um, he got up to a bit of nonsense and he led the Israelites into idol worship. It's not the point. But the 12 tribes are mentioned here, and this is the point. There's a whole religious group that believes only 144,000 people will be saved. That is not the case. This represents the Jews that are saved or called as missionaries and ministers of the gospel during the tribulation once the church has been removed. So before the tribulation starts, the church is removed, I'm running through stuff that has taken me six weeks to work through already, so I'll need you to catch up really quickly here. Church has been removed. Tribulation takes place. And the Jews are used to call in people. And the Jews are redeemed in this situation here. So the 144,000, it doesn't mean only 144,000. It just speaks about equality with each tribe and that the Hebrew nation is called. It's the great revival for the Jews that take place then there's a lot of speculation. Will more, uh, will other people, will Gentiles, will they, those be born again? I'm not going to get into that now. And don't get into their life groups. It becomes argumentative. We're going to cover that later. But what I want to say to you this morning is, get into Christ before it's too late. Don't go, well, I don't know if Jesus, when Jesus returns, maybe I'll get born again when I'm old. Why? Why? This is the greatest adventure you could possibly live. This is the most purposeful life you could possibly have. Do not become a Christian so you can rock up at church, tick, the, tick, tick that box off and go, oh, well, I've made it to church, because that's not being a Christian. That just means you're busy on a Sunday morning. Because this is the reality. I want you to listen to this. It says that there was a multitude of every tribe, every tongue, people, everyone, this great multitude. That means we've got to get a whole lot of people, and this is a great, this is a mini multitude of a variety of tribes. If you look around, there are different tribes and there's different languages and different cultures. But we're on a mission. We're on an absolute mission. And this morning I was going to preach on, you know, last week we covered the seven seals. I was going to cover the, the seven trumpets this week, but it's really hardcore. I couldn't do that to you on Mother's Day. I thought I'd go for something gentler. You've got work to do. You've got work to do. Kind of like the work mom has. Because you've got, this is how moms do work. Have you noticed moms? And I'm loving the season that my oldest daughter's in being a, a mom and then my younger daughter being the auntie. Okay. Because the mom, when the little dude, and he, he's a cute little dude. That venom is cute, man. He is epic. Caleb is amazing. He's much nicer than all your kids. <laughs> and you're allowed to have your opinion. <laughs> it's my first grandson. Leave me alone. And, uh, and when Caleb whines and Leah, the youngest one, doesn't feel like it, she doesn't have to do anything. But Caitlin's the mom. 
has to do something. It doesn't matter what time. It doesn't matter her energy levels. It doesn't matter how she feels. Moms aren't allowed to get sick. Moms aren't allowed to get tired. Moms are nodding. Dad's saying, what do you mean? That's how we should be as Christians. Come on, we call the bride of Christ. You might as well start not behaving like chicks, but start behaving the way moms do. And this is the transformation that we have to go through. We have to shift from being, and this is a prophetic word, we're part of a, an international group called New Covenant Ministries International, NCMI. And prophetic word spoken over NCMI is this, is we need to shift from being a cruise ship. It's nice, calm waters. It's lacquer. A cruise ship is fun. You get on there, what's the entertainment for today? Shuffleboard, have you watched shuffleboard? They throw this marble thing down a deck and then they polish it so it can land at a certain place. That is what you do just before you die of boredom. <laughs> just as you can feel your blood pressure dropping, your heart is slowing down, your will to live has now ended. That's what you play. They've made it an Olympic sport. Or if you want to go watch a movie, or what do you feel like eating? Perhaps you enjoy uh, steak, then you go and eat your steak, and, and you prefer snot, so you go and eat oysters and, and mussels, and whatever you feel like, you go and you go and enjoy that on the, on the cruise ship. On the cruise ship, you'll have 4,000 people holidaying, and 1,000 people working. And those 1,000 people... That 20% has to do 100% of the work to make it lacquer for everyone else. And, the, and, it's, and there's a lot of status in it, because the deeper your cabin, the cheaper your tickets were. So I, I don't go on cruise ships. I look at the stuff. I feel motion sickness. I'm built for land. So I've, I've heard. So when you go on the cruise ship, the more sta- oh, cruise ship music. <laughs> as, as you go down deeper... You start hearing the drone of the engines a little bit more. It becomes a status thing. It's the further you walk down, and then the thing moves. While you sleep, while you eat, it's got this rhythmic movement, and it's just to cater for your needs, as long as you're happy. And when you, That's not church, by the way. I don't want you sitting here thinking, this is a nice church. I'm visiting this church. I'm going to become a member here or a partner, whatever he wants to call it, because I like that idea. No, we need to change our mindsets from being those on a cruise ship to those on a battleship. Because on a battleship, everyone works. Ooh, there was a life in this meeting when I spoke about the cruise ship. I say battleship, and you guys go. To shift from this mentality, they'll do the work, to I'll do it. How do you think this all gets done? Well, Jesus sends angels from Monday to Friday. He does send a few. They called my staff, and they do amazing work. But we have communion set up. There are people that get here at half past seven on a Sunday, and they set it up here. There's things that need to get done. We need 100% of the people to 100% of the work. A cruise ship never goes into dangerous waters. A battleship is there for dangerous waters. A, a cruise ship never saves anyone. A battleship is designed to go and see other vessels saved, to see others that are lost at sea redeemed. A cruise ship, you come and go as you please. A battleship, I'm committed to this mission. I'll see it to the end. A battleship understands authority. A cruise ship, we each do our own thing. A battleship, I'm committed. I want to know the briefing. I want to attend the meetings. I want to get to prayer meeting. I want to be in a life group. I want to be integrated into the life of this battleship. So when the purple hits the fan, I'm not hiding behind the fan. I'm saying, how do we clean up? How do we heal? How do we love? A cruise ship, you just attend. A battleship becomes part of your life. A cruise ship, we judge people on appearance. A battleship, we're the same. doesn't matter language and tribe, color. We serve together, one purpose. 
it should not matter who the elders are. When the soldiers are on the battleship, they don't go, oh, this captain, he's a bit difficult. Excuse me, sir, sir, I want to go to another one. Bloop, 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 bloop. They go, it doesn't matter who's calling the shots as long as those calling the shots are hearing the one who leads us, and it's Jesus Christ. Hold on. And, and we're going to have more elders coming onto this team. We're going to have more pastors coming on the team. And you can't go, ooh, I don't really recognize him as a pastor. This is not a democracy. I don't feel comfortable. I'm so sorry. All complaints can be put on top of the roof, and we'll get to them at an appropriate. That's battleship mentality. We're on a mission. We want to get it done. Each person doing their thing, and it might be uncomfortable. It might be difficult. But you know this. So how do we go from having a cruise ship mentality to a battleship mentality? And that's what I want to address really quickly this morning. I'm going to keep it really simple and really short because I know you guys have all got pizzas on the way and nobody does roasts anymore because you don't know if the oven's going to be on when you get home. (laughs) Something has to take place in us for us to change that mentality. Something's got to shift. I I don't want to say, you know, put up your hands if you do nothing in church. So if you literally just rock up here on a Sunday and you rock up at a life group, and you rock up at premium. If you think that's serving in a church, no, that's attending. Would you be able to put up your hand if I said, where are you serving aggressively to see the kingdom come? Would it make you feel uncomfortable? I'd never do that to you. But something of our thinking has to change, and I'm looking at the text, and I'm looking at the word, and I'm saying, Lord, what changes in us for us to have this external change? Romans 12 verse 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this transformation has to take place by the renewing of our mind. How? You know the scripture. I'm sure half of you have heard this text before. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And some of you will even quote it, but ye be he transformed, quoting from the King James. That's what we do. How? What is the practical way? Because I can sit here and I can tell you about battleship and cruise ship and you can walk out to lacquer and walk out and it changes nothing. Until you look at this, and the, the, word, the, the, the word transformation here also is referenced as transfiguration. It's the Greek word metamorpho. And metamorpho means it's the metamorphosis from worm to botterflich. I know it's a schoonlapper, don't start with me. When I was small, I was busy telling a buddy of mine, I see this butterfly. And he says, Afrikaans light. And I'm like, it's a butterfly. Butterflieg. <laughs> so, how do you go from being a worm to the butterfly? What needs to take place for that transformation in you? And I'm not saying you're a worm. But how do we see this transformation? There's another place where this word transformation is used. It's, it's when Jesus is on the Mount Trans, of Transfiguration and something takes place. He, he, he's on the mountain and he's with his wrestling team, the rock and the sons of thunder. And he's transfigured. His, his face is glowing and his clothing is glowing. And he, he look, the same word, this metamorphosis. He goes through this metamorphosis. We've got to look at how this takes place. And in Mark chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Then a cloud appeared while Jesus has been transformed, covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And it hit me yesterday. This is how the transformation takes place. This is how we transform from being worm to butterfly. I don't want to use that illustration. This is how we transform from being cruise ship to battleship mentality for each and every one of us. These are, this is not these. This is the key to this transformation. Not keys, because it's not one of the four. It's all of the following four things. The first one is, and it comes from that text, 
Let me read it to you again. If you can have it on the screen again, Mark 9. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. So this is the key to transformation. And this is for you. And this is every single one of you. And if you're just visiting for the weekend. And you've, you know, you've popped in because it's Mother's Day. It's fantastic. This applies to you. And often I say to people when I'm preaching, don't think, man, this applies to that person. Today you can think that as well. Today you can think, this applies to my husband. This applies to my children. This applies to me. We can hold each other accountable on this. This is it. The very first one. His presence. The cloud. Part of the transformation that Jesus goes through, part of this metamorphosis, is he's in the presence of God. You've got to learn to spend time in the presence of God, friends. You, you, you have to be in the presence of God. And it's not incense and it's not ritual. It's just a bit of time. You have to start practicing, guys. We will never transform into what God has called us to be if we don't spend time in his presence. You've got to be with him. And it, you might start off with three minutes and five minutes and you can build it up. But as Christians, we've got to hang out with Jesus. You have to spend time with him. If we never spend time in the, when I say on the cloud, I don't mean downloading stuff and uploading stuff and watching Netflix video. I'm talking about spiritual reference to the cloud. That would work in the youth group. Wow. The worm mentality says, I don't have time. The butterfly mentality says, I'm with him now. Let me spend time with him. I'm sitting at the office. I'm waiting in traffic. I'm not in Secunda, really, unless it's Friday afternoon. I'm having my lunch. Lord, what is it that you want to say to me? What is it that you're speaking into my life? God, I've got all my requests. You know those things, but what are you saying to me? You've got to understand this time with him. And the very next thing for transformation, you've got to know that you're a son. You've got to get your identity straight. You've got to get your identity straight. You'll never be transformed while you think you're a worm. You'll never be transformed if you don't understand you're a son of God. And I'm not talking gender here. I'm talking inheritance. You have access to the Father and everything that the Father has, you have access to. You have access to every spiritual gift. You have the ability to be prophetic. I'm not saying you're a prophet. You have the ability to be prophetic and speak into people's lives, into your children's lives. Call out the gold in them. You have to understand this. You're a son. You're a son of the Most High God. If you never settle that, you'll never see transformation. If you don't settle that, you're a son of God. You know when I say son, I mean son and daughter. I'm just referencing it for the point of view of inheritance. The son inherits everything. If you don't settle that, you will never, ever, ever understand how valuable you are. And if you never understand how valuable you are, you'll never walk into what God's called you to walk in. By the way, all I'm doing this morning is I'm preaching through the prophetic words that were shared earlier. There it spoke about being with him. There it spoke about value. You see, God says, this is my son. Know your identity, whom I love. Know your worth. You've got to get it that you're loved. And not in a weird, creepy way. And not by a bad dad. And not even a great mom. By God. By God. I'm a, I'm a good dad. I'm a better grandfather. I've often said to people, if I knew being a grandfather was this much fun, I would have gone straight to that. <laughs> this is way easier. But that little dude... Where's Marco? My little Caleb. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we... No. I, I look at this little grandson of mine. I love him so much, there's nothing I wouldn't do, nothing I wouldn't provide, nothing that I wouldn't set in place for his future. I, I'm already saying, we need to set up funds for this kid. He's going to study one day. We need to, we need to start a, a wealth plan for him. We need to get these things set up so he can do whatever God is calling. He doesn't even know my name. I'm the, just the dude with the upside down face because everyone else is bald at the bottom and got hair on top, but this guy's flipped over. And he looks at me and he's like, and everyone's got this lovely, gentle voice saying, Hello, Caleb. And I'm like, Hey, my boy. 
And to him, it's this terrifying ogre who leans in on him and my head's as big as he is. I'm like, hey, my boy, I love you. No. He'll smile, but it's that, you're going to eat me. <laughs> and he has no grasp, no concept of how much I love him, how much the family loves him. We'll do anything, anything for him. Get that into your head. That's how God sees us. And he's coming to us and saying, I love you so much. Like, oh. As opposed to walking with this confidence and this favor. And he gets you. And, like, and Leon said, he's got your back. And then he rewrites your destiny. Newspaper into water. Print gets removed. Gets dried. Gets reprinted. Your destiny, no matter what you've been through. It's a mess. It's a disaster. God goes, I love you too much to leave that as your future. I'll rewrite it if you submit to me. But you've got to know who you are. I'm big and I'm bold. Shut up. No, you're mine. Just get that. Get that. I have to make this disclaimer. I'm not upset. <laughs> A worm says, I must earn love. The butterfly goes, I'm loved. You have no idea. I do not care how much sin you have in your life. Honestly, look, when Caleb poops, I'm granddad. <laughs> I don't change nappies. I do the upward, I do the upper area management. <laughs> that stuff is mom. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how foul he might smell on the odd occasion, or if he burps and he messes. Do you get it? Do you get it? It's that mushy, stupid love. I have my buddy saying to me, "Ad, you always used to seem a bit rough, but now you seem soft." Sick man, you can tell me I'm soft. <laughs> I'll knock you out. Stop it. You gotta get it. Please, friends, I'm gonna hammer this this morning. He just, God likes you, man. He likes you. And that stuff where he'll back you up. You know, yes, but I've sinned and I must repent. Yes! But it's out of repentance to be healed. It's repenting of your sins so you can grow. Not so that he's not going to be ticked off with you anymore. If I don't repent, he's angry. No, you're the one that's broken. He wants to see you healed. He wants to see you restored. Oh, I've messed up. When this little dude, I don't know how he could mess up at this young age. But if he does something, I just, I just like him too much. I'll help him fix it. And when he's older and he gets up to nonsense, I promise you, I'm going to be there with him. <laughs> and I'll be his backup, and I'll be his alibi, and I'll travel with a shovel, and we'll take care of whatever business needs to be taken care of, and I'll have his back, and then I'll walk him into restoration, if that should appear. <laughs> Do you get it that you loved? And then it says, so God, he's, 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 there's this whole cloud, and, and Peter, John, and James, they are freaking out. They are losing their minds. And God is saying, this is my son who I love. Listen to him. You want to see radical transformation? Listen to him. He's not shouting at you. He's not barking at you. He's just saying, listen to him. And you read the word, and, he, and, and, and he'll say things to you. He'll say the smallest things to you. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. That's unhelpful. Maybe that's becoming a bit of a, an addiction. That's unhelpful. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. I love you. I love you. My boy, my, my girl, I love you so much. But let's not do that. It's just, and we start listening to him. And it's not so that he can then get us onto the path of love. It's that he doesn't want to see us destroyed by our own behavior. And it's not rules and regulation. It's unconditional love. The father could have called himself anything to refer. He could have called us commander-in-chief. Jesus is his general. Holy Spirit is his admiral. And we use troops. He could have called us that. Never does. He's going, dad, for a reason. For a reason. And he's saying, this is how much I love you. But will you please just listen to me? Just not out of anger. You've got to lose this mentality. Not, he's never frustrated with you. He is never, ever irritated by you. 
And if you want to know why I can say that, go read 1 Corinthians 13. It talks about love. Love is kind. Love is gentle. It is never irritable. It never boasts. It never boasts in wrongdoing. It's describing God. It's the ultimate reference to us, and it gives me good content to do weddings. But it's describing God in the way he feels about you. If you spend time in his presence, if you'll understand that you're his child, if you'll get that mushy love, and when he speaks to you, you listen, transformation will be easy. This is not a works-based thing. It's love, and out of that, we serve. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and your kindness and the, the gentle love that you have for us. And Lord, I pray for every person this morning that just kind of needs a hug. Just a dad hugging them, saying, you are doing so well. And I know you're battling, and I know you're battling with addictions, but I've got your back. And I know you're battling with extreme pain, but I want to heal you. And I, and I know you're battling in marriages, in relationships, but I love you so much. I thank you, Lord God, that is you. Thank you, Lord, that you never bark at us and moan at us, but you whisper to us and you minister to us. Holy Spirit, I pray, allow us to get that. Allow us to understand that. Reveal that to us this morning. Lord, I pray for people this morning that are online or sitting here. Their bodies are tense because of the chaos that they're going through. I pray that they'll experience peace. Lord, I pray that we'll never reference you based on how our earthly dads have treated us or how other people have treated us, but we will be re we'll redefine the way we see you based on what the Word says about you. Thank you, Lord God, that we loved Thank you, Lord God, that we are treasured. Thank you, Lord God, that you speak to us and that you're waiting to minister to us. Just while eyes are closed and heads are bowed, I'm just asking God now just to minister to you so that you'll get this love thing. Just get this. You need to get this this morning. You're going to walk out there with us that he really loves you. That he really loves you. He loves you unconditionally. The mushy stuff, the embarrassing. Dad wants to hold you and kiss you this morning. And he wants to take you out of whatever mess you find yourself in, even if you got yourself into that mess. And uh, he wants to bring healing. And your, your injuries, your, it could be emotional injuries, could be self-inflicted. They normally are. And he wants to bring healing this morning. And if others have hurt you and, and, and inflicted pain, uh, he, he wants to walk you on that road to you forgiving those that have hurt you. He doesn't throw you out and expect you to figure out before he accepts you. You're in. You're in. When you've given your life to Jesus and you've surrendered to him, you're in. Lord, I pray, bring healing. Bring wholeness and restoration. Lord, where father figures have done a poor job of representing you. Lord God, I pray for a supernatural download on what our heavenly dad is really like. Bring healing this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that we can trust you with everything. Lord, I pray that going into this week, we're going to have these waves of your love washing over us, revealing your heart towards us. And those that are hurt, healing will come. And those that are battling, victory will come. So that we can be transformed, renewed, supernaturally. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your kindness. Lord, thank you that this morning we can celebrate your death and resurrection. As we celebrate moms today, we have a day to remind us to celebrate moms. But we also get to celebrate and remember your death and resurrection. So I'd like to invite every one of you, 
You've given your life to Jesus. At some stage, you do not have to be a member of this church. And those folk that came forward this morning and gave their lives to Jesus, you're invited to the table this morning. We're going to be breaking bread. We have communion every Sunday. We've been doing this for a while now because we just want to, we, we want to do this. And we're finding it. It's, it's, just, it's a beautiful moment that we get to break bread together. So we have tables set up all around the auditorium over in the front there too, on the sides and at the back. Can I ask the families just to go get your cup of juice and your little biscuit, your little cream cracker, make your way back to your seats so we can break bread together and just remember what Jesus has done for us.